friends and welcome again to another episode of just another kill team podcast where we are connecting kill team communities around the globe today we're coming back to the u.s and zooming all the way in on kansas city missouri our guest today is joe travis tell us uh, a little bit about joe yeah you know i met joe last year at the chicago open where i took him down in the finals with Hunter, or in the semi, or actually, it was the, it was actually the finals with uh, Pathfinders and Hunter Clay. I had just won a mirror match and ended up playing against Joe. He had some of the worst luck I've seen in the entire time that I've been playing Kill Team, and he was playing Hunter Clay on in the dark with Pathfinders, which is, you know, for what it's worth, not a good matchup. And he's been, you know, after that moment, he's been on the upswing and moved from. A full-time player to a part-time TO, it sounds like. And he's helping to run the upcoming Gateway Open. Sounds like since the Pathfinder days, he's moved on to the Inquisition squad. So we'll be hearing a little bit from him and seeing how parts of Missouri play the Inquisition agents. Anyways, Joe, if you want to say hello, say hi to the listeners. Hey, guys. Yeah, thanks for having me on. So, uh, yeah, no, glad to be on um, and talk about some Kill Team. Yeah, glad to have you. Yeah, I'm, you know, just in this week's uh, kind of community news, uh, tell us what's going on in the St. Louis area. You know, you've got your tournaments coming up. It sounds like you move from being one of the more competitive players to being one of the helpful tournament organizers to encourage the growth of your local scene, it sounds like. So yeah. tell us what's going on. It is our scene. It has been such a wild ride over this last year. We've gone from... Uh, two of us semi-organizing tournaments around, you know, late last year to um, kind of we had three or four stores that had organized play days to that all fell off and it's just all chaotic. And now we've got so many new people in the community trying to find a new day to get everybody back in a store to play again. And so to that end, we've got the Gateway Open, which I know we'll be talking a bit about later, but coming up on the 19th of August and then. Um, we were actually uh, another local. Uh, Noah is being very helpful in running a sort of tournament league for over the course of August. So I know a lot of people are going to hopefully be using that to get practice in for uh, the Gateway Open stuff. So sounds sounds great. So you've got your <laughs> one primary story. You've got your one big on the horizon event this month, which is cool. Yep. You know, I'll be running the Goonhammer Open that same weekend, so it'll be good to see what our two different regions put out for that weekend. <laughs> Speaking yeah. of, you know, small regional tournaments, I it sounded like you went to one this weekend where the <laughs> uh, the Garrett Dynasty took de- took another ticket from the yes. U.S. scene. Yes. Um. So I traveled down to um, the America's Team Championship in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, this last weekend. So. Uh, uh, Brett from Six Sided Legion also flew in. We were hoping to one of us take the golden ticket. Unfortunately, neither of us did. But I, uh, it could not have gone to a better player. It was nice to see. I know Liam's been gunning for uh, the golden ticket for a while now. So uh, the event itself was a bit odd. I know originally it was listed as like a 64 player event when we first registered, and then I guess just to I know the ATC is a big. 40k like big hammer kind of event so i don't know what ended up happening they just didn't get a lot of sign up so eventually they just shrunk the event down to a 10 player two day or one day event so but it was an absolute murderer's row like everybody that showed up there we had we were hoping that it wasn't there weren't going to be any cultist players but there were two at the last minute and that just so and that swung the, the whole dynamic of the thing around too it was just a it was a whole it was a whole mess it was a great time but not my best showing <laughs> so, you know yeah. the cultists the cultists do remain a tough nut to crack and you've got to have a game plan around them specifically for atc did they play a mixed format or did they do all open all it inter- was all open so okay. uh leander garrett was uh nice enough to step in and run the tournament since uh, uh he had uh, yeah he'd already he already has already his been, ticket yeah exactly so yep um and so uh both of 
uh, Leander's parents also were participating in the event too. So it seemed to have a good time. I have yet to, so when you get to play Mark, um, I, Mark's fine gentleman. I, that's what, yeah, no, 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 very nice. Yeah. Great folks. So, yeah. um, I did have a, uh, the opportunity to play against, uh, I, I apologize if I get the name wrong, but Weisma, the Garrett's mother. Oh, Wasima, I think. Wasima, yes. thank you, yeah, Wasima. Yeah. I am so That's sorry. Right. So, but yes, and she was incredible. So that was a fantastic game we had there too, and stuff. So just glad to. It's nice to see a whole family yep, playing. They're the team. they're, you know, it's like they're a real... tight knit unit for sure. <laughs> for for any of the listeners who don't know, there's a team on the East Coast, the Garrett's. They've uh, made their waves in the Kill Team scene. <laughs> I played against them at the very first Kill Team Open way back in uh, 2022. I took down Liam, and then I think Leander just barely missed the cutoff for pause, I I want to say. But since then, they've done much better. Obviously, this year, Liam, uh, Liam and Leander got pretty high up in Kansas City with Leander winning Adepticon. Uh, I think Mark and Liam both did very well at Kansas City, with Mark taking, I want to say, second, only losing yep. to Colts. And yep. Liam losing one time on Felgor. So this is like a very tight knit family that's been playing Kill Team and doing very well. And now they have two tickets for the currently four members playing. It sounds like <laughs> Wasima t- came in to fill up the tournament at the last second. Yeah, I think. And actually, I think I know. Um, I'm pretty sure Mark went undefeated at Kansas City because we had a weird. Yes, he did. Uh, he okay, did. he was, was 5 0 and they won it the last round, yep. but he went 5 0 yeah. against. Yeah, so they didn't quite yeah. finish out the tournament. I think both of them, so. in their interviews for Goonhammer, both really wanted to play out their final round. Yeah. <laughs> so as a nod to that, actually, Tampa now has the sixth round there, just in case. You yes. Know, we, we don't want the unsatisfying finish when people have the time to play. So right. it's a nice little nod. So the Garrett's have been shaping the Kill Team communities um, yeah. this whole year, really. Yeah. It's, I know Liam's finished one spot ahead of me at Kansas City, so... I was. I'm glad I finally got a chance to play him. So that was. He's, uh, a, he's a hard. He's a hard competitor <laughs> for sure. The whole family yeah. is is stand up people and very good at kill team because yeah. they do. They practice quite a bit. <laughs> but you know, unlike the Polish community, their family will not shy away from the challenge of how do I play the best team <laughs> the best way. <laughs> how do you like? Did you? So what was the family playing? What are you playing? What were those matches up? at sure. uh, Chattanooga look, looking like. So they were playing. So Liam played commandos. I know that he has. He's always raised, been a commando player. Yes, yeah. he's always been. A, and I know that there had been some talk when the uh, last, I guess there's a, uh, they have a sheet where they have to sign out which teams were going to claim who's going to yes. play what. And I know, I think Liam initially jumped on Felgor. I forget. I, I forget who jumped on Coltis and stuff, but I know. He had considered taking them to Chattanooga, but um, yeah, it was, uh, but still, um, he managed to, I think he had a pretty good game plan to just try and stall stall out the clock and things, it, it looks like. To, so with a 15-person team, that uh, the Colt can take a while to play through, especially if it's a newer person trying to pilot them. There's a lot going on there, so um, I, I, I've taken, I took Inquisition there. Um, I, man, that is a, you talk about a tough nut to crack. Like even, I feel like I know at this point, I know what they do until I remember that, oh yeah, there's another layer. And then there's another thing. There's damage reduction. And then there's, and it's like, man, and I just, I have yet to come up with a solid, anything I feel good about taking into it. But yeah, it's, uh, that was probably my worst game of the day, just in terms of, dice luck and my opponent was fantastic i mean i have a shout out to to chris there from uh, i think it was from montgomery came out and he was yeah but i mean great guy just man i could not i think i spent my all my cp in the first round trying not to kill myself with overheated plasma oh no so yeah that was a bad time when you're when your pistolier is rolling three ones on an overheated plasma shot or something it's uh not a good time. Not a good time at all. So no, no. sometimes these happen. <laughs> yeah. So, Joe, do you actually feel like the Polish and Spanish scenes have the right of it where if people are playing or if a team comes out looking <laughs> maybe a little bit too strong out of the box that players should be maybe disincentivized from picking up these teams? I know it's a community um, sure. feeling that I've had echoed in my community. I'm sure that, you know, 
I'm sure it comes up in other communities. How has your community dealt with it? What's your opinion on it? I'm just curious. I'm of two minds on it specifically. So right now <clears throat> we had discussed the potential of disallowing Colts for the gateway open that we were going to make the announcement hopefully far enough in advance because it is such a, it can be such a tilting matchup and we do have enough new, newer players and things coming out and we wanted to keep the field somewhat open just so we didn't have to have everybody trying to tech for just with one team because I mean right now I remember it seems it's really odd to me that I remember all of the salt that came out with when Felgor dropped it seemed like that was just everywhere on the internet everybody you listen to it's like you know into the world Felgor but then Colts come out they're like yeah maybe they're okay until everybody started putting them on the table <laughs> and uh but <clears throat> that's uh uh, so on one hand, on the competitive side, GW is the one that releases the rules. They put them out there. They're legal. Um, I if for a especially for something like um, you know GW opens and like events that have like invitations of the nationals on the line, I think you have to take what is good. You have to take what's allowable by the rules. You have to. So I mean. If you don't want to play with them, then you need to figure out a way to beat them. So, and that's kind of the route I'm taking with that. So, I mean, it's not on me to stop somebody or make them feel ashamed for what they're taking. I don't think that anyone should ever have to feel bad. I mean, because we've got some local players and stuff, too, who, you know, they play Big 40K and they play, you know, Chaos or what. I don't know my Big 40K that well, but they had spent time putting together their you know, dark commune and they think they're really cool. And so they want to take them and kill team two. And it's like, I don't know. I don't want them to feel bad for, for playing that stuff too. You know? So I, and I it's see. the other, I think the other thing is at the end of the day, you still have to play the game. Well, so Colts, if you make mistakes and you get a bunch of dudes blasted off early on, you're still going to lose. It's just, right. you have <laughs> way better of a position to maybe crawl it back compared to, say, Vetguard losing half their team on turn one, right? Because yes. your later game punching is so much weaker on most teams. So you can still make mistakes, and games can still be close, um, but players have to be good at the end of the day. So if you never mm -hmm. get to play them, you never get to practice them, those players are never going to get better in any of the ways that they would learn a new skill set on Chaos Cults. And that's a, that's a net negative for people who want to play just Cults. And I have definitely met a couple players who are like, I just think they're cool. And like, I can't disagree with them. I think me <laughs> and Jason were the exact same amount of like, yeah, look at these neat little dudes. He looks like a little monster. He's got a monster crawling out of his arm. Why? That looks neat. And then now people are just like, oh, I don't want to play against them. Like, just yeah, if you're going to be a competitive player, know that there's always going to be a matchup that you don't like. That's never going to go away. Every team, even back when. You know, Pathfinders were the most broken team. Yep. They still had bad matchups. Commandos were still kind of rough for them. Vetguard have always been rough for them. Now that matchup is even worse because of the nerfs. And there's always going to be bad matchups. There's always going to be like stuff that people don't like. And if you don't adapt to it, you're never going to get better in those situations. Because you can always go lean back on like, oh, you know what? Someone's going to fix this and I'm not going to have to play them. Right. And that's precisely, I mean, as a, I kind of just picked up Pathfinders, you know, just when I started because I, you know, they like they looked cool. They seemed neat. I hadn't played a lot of, so I didn't really have a lot of attachment to any one particular faction. So, but the amount of just sometimes salt that you would get just like sitting down to a table, it's like, oh, you're that guy. I'm like, I don't know. It just it doesn't feel good to be on that end, especially when you're not. You know, I don't know. I know that it's. I think it's a lot bigger of an issue in like 40 you know, like power gaming or whatever term you want to attach to it. I don't think it's as much of an issue here in Kill Team, but. I also think generally the balance and stuff in kill team is a lot better. And like you said, it's not an auto win for sure. Like you still have to be good at the end of the day that so. Yeah, you still have to pick the mutations. You still have to move your models in the right position. You can't move. You can't waste activations with mutants or torments because now those models are substantially more important to your overall game plan than just your devotees. So if players aren't actually using them correctly there's still room to beat them. And if you are watching a player who doesn't know what they're doing, play Colts, and you are the very experienced player, probably should still be able to beat them. Maybe if it's a really good player on Colts, it is becomes a much, much more difficult issue. But at your local level, you know, for a lot of players who listen to this, there's probably not going to be as big a deal. You might lose, but 
then again, if you can't lose a game and get back up on your feet and say, what did I do wrong in this game? How can I do better? It's not really much to do if you want to get better. Because, you know, <laughs> in me and Joe's game, when we played at Chicago, I was just like, Joe, these are great moves. Just if you roll all ones on your fusion grenade, it doesn't matter. <laughs> that was yeah, a... like one of the other things to keep in mind is like not everyone is bringing the boogeyman team to every game. So like you can show up to a whole event and there might only be like one or two people playing the matchup that you're really not looking forward to. And then the bottom line is to have fun. So even if you do run into a matchup that you're not super excited about, just like be a good sport, have fun stick with it and then uh if that's the one game you lose then win all the rest of them say say yeah and if you need to if you're trying to win games maybe having a super accurate measuring gauge would help <laughs> and we've got that in spades here at just another kill team podcast isn't that right jason that is absolutely true you can get your hands on just another kill team gauge and you can even Listen to the end of the podcast to find a secret password that can maybe even get you a discount. Yeah, keep your keep your ears peeled for Joe's voice at the end of the podcast because he's going to have a code word thought up by that. So I guess that's a, a hint and a moment for Joe to start thinking of a password if you haven't already. Yeah, but bring it all back around to the local communities. I really make or the reason why the three of us are on this podcast to begin with, because without our local hometown heroes. There, I don't think we would have as much dedication to this project or even to our individual tournament scenes. Seeing individual players get better or become more committed to their communities, that's definitely a thing that kind of drives my volunteer efforts, at least on my end. And I'm sure, Joe, you've probably got at least a story or two locked away in your noodle somewhere. So you want to tell us about your, your favorite hometown hero? Uh, yeah, I would uh, specifically like to call out uh jonathan reynolds jd i know part of the good friend of Amber. the ch- friend of the pod yeah that's uh he has been like he's just a it's kind of part of the broader i guess st louis sort of you know area meta if you want he organizes a lot of the events in springfield and stuff so it's a couple you know, it's an hour and a half drive or something for us so we'll we'll head out there to his events that he'll bring in a squad of guys from like to our events and stuff and now he's just a fantastic i mean voice just to have around for you know engaging with the community organizing stuff so he's uh a very much an asset to the community here so and we've also had some you know also paul in our local community who also organizes some events and stuff too and then also you know shout out to Noah again for organizing the crump cup oh, which is crump. Uh, the Crump Cup, yes, which we're, I think I'm supposed to have my first game of tomorrow, so yeah. Oh, we'll this have is a, your, your local league, basically, right? Yeah, the local league, exactly. Nice name. So, yeah, exactly. You guys, that, you guys that, have little uh, green orc skin arms for the Crumpum I trophy? He's got, yeah, some very nice, some very cool trophies and stuff that he found for, so yeah, it'll be, it'll be a fun time. So, Looking yeah. forward to uh, seeing how, because it's basically one of the good things for leagues is it's like a good way to like test out new strategies over a long period of time. Are you guys fixing the team selections or are you doing a, kind of a freeform league? I think it is fixed team selections. I'm a lot less involved in this since I am so. You finally get to be a player so. again. Yes, exactly. That's so it'll be nice to just go out and and I've got so many Inquisition things I still need to try because I have not gotten nearly the table time with him as I should have right now, that there's just, it was not a great idea to try new strats on tournament day. I'll say that much. Yeah. <laughs> but, Inquisition yeah. seemed like a tough, seemed like a, a very complicated book with a lot of good options, but if you don't know all of them and you don't know where to look, you might get a little lost in the pages. Yeah, that is definitely true. Um, for this week's Operative Showdown, Jason, you want to take us away? Yes, so let's move into the Operative Showdown. Operative Showdown. The Operative Showdown is the section of the podcast where we bring up two different operatives or sometimes a couple different pairs and then just compare, contrast, and uh, see what's the better choice. Yeah, and as a Pathfinder, former Pathfinder player to another former Pathfinder player, I know that this comes up a lot for Pathfinder players on Discords is... Which drones do we take? We've got the recon drone, the grav accelerator drone, or no, grav inhibitor drone, which is the slow charge. We have the pulse accelerator, which is the increase 
uh, free retains for pulse weapons. Got the recon drone, which is probably one of the best ones, but you have to sacrifice an operative to use. The gun drone, and then the mark drone and the shield drone. So we got lots of choices, and people never know which ones to take, but in your experiences, which ones are the ones that you must take, which ones you are the ones that you kind of take, and which ones you never take? That is... I This will be controversial, I'm sure, but especially post-nerf, I never take the recon drone. I think the recon drone is a trap. But... Tell I mean, us why. Not... Tell us why. Tell us why. Don't just uh, don't just leave us there. Sure. Don't leave us hanging, <laughs> I think that it is particularly yeah, so now that you're down to twelve operatives. I think that needing the um, extra slot for somebody that can perform mission actions and things because the the whole trick is you have to for for the drones to be able to perform mission actions, they have to be enabled to by the drone operator and whatnot. So um, the the re rolls are nice. But you're also to get the if you use it, you're also sacrificing another activation, the the specific buff, which escapes me right now. But so you're going from 12 activations down to 11, down to 10 if you also use the drone operator to activate one of the drones and things. So it can be you can sacrifice a lot of the toolbox that makes Pathfinders really good. And this, Relentless is good, but. You have enough access to rerolls on other parts of the team between marker lights and bonded and things that I think that um, the I don't think the recon drone, especially the gun being heavy and whatnot. I just I don't think it's a great operative. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I I'm probably agree with that. I think there's a handful of matchups where the recon's extra capabilities can be useful, mm-hmm. and that's when you really want to be able to push maybe a paired model advantage. So maybe a rail plus the recon in a corner can really shut down a corner compared to, you know, an elite team. So the for anyone who doesn't know, the recon drone is a special um, drone operative that replaces two Pathfinders. And its special weapon or its special capability is to have someone else go right after it. So effectively it's spotting. So it chain activates, GA2 is a pair. And then the paired model gets relentless on its weapon. So if you're doing it paired with a rail rifle where you have normally four attacks on fours, uh, four, four mortal wounds, two. So it's effectively four, six AP one. Uh, and if you give it full rerolls, then you don't need to do as much marker light support because now you can just use all four of your dice and pray for crits as you reroll all eight of them. And that can be relatively potent against big, tough models where you don't want to babysit, perhaps on an in the dark situation. But in a generic open board situation where you need mission actions or you need to be able to have more models be able to see more parts of the map or just that the recon drones gun is maybe not the strongest maybe you're not getting enough value out of it and you'd rather just have one extra guy with both a marker light a gun and the ability to push buttons uh, what what about the other smaller drones is there an mvp <laughs> drone that you always take now or which you know the, the ones that you never drone. take sure the okay. shield drone is it. my my mvp because with the forward deploy and i that guy is just such a champ button pusher and then the tack op getter so i mean do you need somebody to go push a button and then go sit on top of a vantage that's your guy and he is just i mean with the five up feel no pains and things like he's just really in the invuln saves it's very hard an opponent will have to put a disproportionate amount of effort into trying to dislodge that particular model from so I find that it can be a distraction piece or and then if they're doing that, they're not doing other stuff. So that's always a nice to have on the team. Yep. Yeah. So the shield drone, it's got a four up invuln and a five up feel no pain, but base. It also does save your protocol, so it can kind of work as a medic sometimes. So you you know, if you keep it on a forward position, you can have a maybe a grenadier run into its range, chuck the grenade and then pray, which is nice. So there's some nice strategies to be had there. I mean, and honorable mentions go to both the, you know, marker light drone and the uh, and the gun drone. I mean, the gun drone is just it's solid. It's it's relentless built in. It's I mean, it flies. And so having that kind of scalpel that you can use to really just I mean, if you give an extra APL so it can move dash or I mean, with Montca and whatnot, like it's got a bunch of different potential i mean just with the rest of the pathfinder movement shenanigans that yes it can yeah it's very on, on open having a handful of yes. select models with fly that all have relatively mm-hmm. powerful weapons 
it can be nice having the gun drone you know four attacks on fours four five relentless means that it's generally going to land maybe about three hits is what i generally expect and if it does you know you see a lot of dice so it, it generally gets a crit somewhere in there still got a four up save which is nice and it still gets Montcon all the other stuff. So you're right. Yeah, those are the ones I never, I never generally have ever used the grav inhibitor or the pulse accelerator. Just not enough reason for those. So if you're a new Pathfinder player or an aspiring Pathfinder player, now that they are no longer the boogeyman and people will let you play them on the greater good, those would be our, you know, I got stamp of approval on Joe's Joe's operative showdown picks there. I've tried the, I've tried them out a little bit on Into the Dark particularly the uh, the Pulse Accelerator drone, just because it seems like you're having to spread operatives out a lot more sometimes, so bonded isn't always as effective, but yeah, it, just, it still doesn't beat the utility of a lot of the other drones, I think. So, yeah. yeah. I think I think on In the Dark, I use the Recon drone in a, in a bid towards the assumption that for the areas that I need marker lights, I'm not going to have room to set them up. So being able to have a paired model means that at least those that pair can reliably put shots down range while also moving around together. So that was my impetus. You could also do the normal move plus guard with a recon drone, which is not normally a thing that you can do on open. So being able to get a normal move shot with six attacks on fours is or wait, six attacks, six attacks on fours yeah. or five attacks on fours. Uh, I think it's six. I'd have to go back and check. You can tell how much I use this. <laughs> use yeah. the uh, the operative that is six attacks on four. So for okay. the so for listeners who don't know, and obviously for the the you know us podcast hosts who don't know, <laughs> it's six attacks on four is three four. So it's a six attack bolter on fours with recon drone, but it has ceaseless. So it's allowed to reroll ones, which is a very powerful buff to have. So I, at least on In the Dark, I felt like there was a reason to do it. I don't think on Open there's as much of a reason to do it unless you're playing against a uh, basically a space marine player and against an open board where you think you're going to be able to line up and early analyze with a rail rifle to just snipe a model out maybe i could see a reason there because then you can angle for a first turn if you can remove a space marine at the very first play 11 to 5 is a nice nice playing ground for the pathfinders yeah not that they probably really need it but it does help a little bit more nowadays with the intercession matchup being one of the harder matchups just because they can shoot you so much easier and a good Space Marine player for people who are hearing this and seething against the greater good rage. The big thing on open is just go all in engage and start shooting as much as you can. Because there's only a handful of Pathfinder models that can actually shoot. And they yep. need the support uh, of their friends. They need the support of their friends. So if you've got in an general, intercessor... Space Marines just want to keep shooting like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, it's not intuitive. So being able to send in your dudes, get on top of it, and start blasting the uh, concealed marker light models if there's not enough heavy cover is very powerful and definitely is a thing that helps against both vet card and pathfinders but getting on to the new niches yeah so here we are again in the next segment this one is niche tactics niche tactics this is where we get a little nitty gritty with specific plays specific details um some of your favorite combos and plays yeah yeah we're gonna swing it back to the inquisition with the hope that we didn't vet this, so Joe, you tell us hey. what ancillary options for the Inquisition <laughs> are you getting deep and deep and down with? It's uh, interesting in that. So I both I agree with two thirds of last week's guess suggestions. However, I think Kasserkin are way better than Vetguard, and I will defend this pick because I think that the so one so in the after I got a little burned out with Pathfinders after Chicago Open last year, switched to a couple other teams. So Breachers and Blooded mainly. And one of the biggest issues I had with those teams is how static they are. The threat ranges and stuff are you know very much where they're going to go and I mean there's there's some, you know, tricks you can pull off, especially with breachers, uh, to get around some of that, but for the most part they're not nearly as movemently dynamic as pathfinders are and so one thing that i really appreciate about all of the support options that inquisition can take is that each option can radically change the way that the team plays so with the casserkin suddenly you have the ability to threaten the like you can push up the board much more aggressively on turn one potentially with the two recon dashes and if you're taking embedded agents you can also burn um it 
to in the scouting phase to take an additional scouting option. So you can take infiltrate and then you have two recon dashes, which can set you up for some very interesting I mean, you can put the servitor on a vantage point potentially, threaten some shooting with that. You can put an operative further up the board to start hitting points early. It's I'm not saying I use it every game, but it is definitely a nice tool to have in the pocket. So here's a question. Can you do this the so you take two recon dashes? Can you do both of those on the same model or do they have to be separate models? It has to be separate models. If you look at the way the recon is worded, it has to be you can only dash a model that is in your deployment zone. I believe it says holding within your deployment zone. So, yes. man, if you could do a double, I had, you can uh, you can do some juking, but you are not allowed to have two one model make a six inch move. Yeah, you can have a model like reposition from one part of your deployment to the other part, basically six inches away. Yeah. Oh, well, that's yeah. fair. Yeah, as long as you're holy within to start, that is the only thing that matters. So you can say holy within twice. It's just that's not really doing what I think most people, he- when they hear double recon, I... it's not doing what they think. So that's generally what I've told people when they ask me that. Because you're right, you can't do two recons. You just can't yes. take a double recon to the midboard. Right. That's uh, I misunderstood that for a while. So in my early games with Pathfinders, I definitely cheated on that a little bit. Not any tournaments, thankfully. That was caught before. But I was like, oh yeah, this recon... Huh, and then everything. I was like, oh, let's just recon dash and then take my uh, recon with the recon drone and go up a little bit further. And that's when the recon drone kind of started losing the favor for me once I realized I couldn't six inch dash. So, yes, it's uh. no, not a lot to get up too far ahead. Last mm. week, we talked a lot about the breachers and the exaction squad. So it sounds mm-hmm. like you're playing the Kasserkin a reasonable amount. I, they are a, they are my drop into elites, effectively. Okay. I do. I have, I mean, so I understand the vet guard take, like I understand like rostering them and whatnot. I, the demo troop, my main, so Kasserkin being able to, I mean, having the best comms in the game paired with one of the best just overall tool sets that you have, like, I mean, just in terms of operative loadouts and things, like I find that that mixed with the other, I mean, everything else you can take with the cat. Like, I'm not... For the the bomb play on the vet guard, you have to tie up so many of your resources. It's essentially dedicating your comms to it and other things that... I. It's just not something that... And especially as not being a vet guard player myself, it is not something that I have a lot of practice with. So, you know, the Kasserkin for me are a much more... I, I don't want to say straightforward option necessarily in... But the the tool set that they bring works very well for me in trying to like especially remove elites. Like I'm thinking like legionaries and uh, um, intercession in particular. So yes. it sounds like your goal there is to make sure you have the most high quality, high AP shots yep. that you can line up at your opponent's indiscretion because that you have the model advantage as far as activation right. care. So you're really just yeah. waiting till you have a bunch of things lined up so you can just move dash, shoot. And if it deletes an elite, great. That's all you care about. So you're not trying to get too fancy with either the breachers or the vet guard in that case. Yeah, and there's some, I mean, with the amount of ways that you can use, I mean, you've got quarry, which is great for re-rolls, which does help. I mean, that is one, if I've got a complaint about Inquisition, which I, I don't overall besides their complexity but it is how unreliable sometimes a shooting can be just because almost all of your shooters are on fours so being able to take that sharp shooter is really nice and i know that's obviously an option in uh vet guard as well but the without having a lot of the tools that i mean totally understand why the spotter isn't available and i uh but the lack of like the confidant is a little strange to me like if i could have ga2 on a stick that would be kind of nice to have around and the extra body, but you know, it's just the, so the recon trooper. And then once the recon troopers get um, the dash is taken care of, essentially he can become an extra body to go do stuff or the no cover is sometimes it's kind of nice to be able to just deny cover on a model. Sometimes you just need it. So, yeah, I mean, I think no cover is a role that a lot of people underestimate, but when you look at how good, wide teams with five up save saves are a lot of it comes down to i get a free retain and cover so you need to hit three or three to four shots before my model is reliably injured or killed 
Yep. So being able to remove that has been very good. I'm sure that Jason's got plenty of words to say about no cover with his incursor run. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> definitely true. I had no idea, and then just all of a sudden I've got regular just bolt guns with no cover dropping other space marines, and I'm just like, dang, no cover is a way bigger deal than I ever thought. <laughs> I hadn't even thought about that build of Phobos because I've got a Phobos team that's nicely painted collecting dust somewhere on a shelf, right? And it's uh, it's like, huh, I think I need to go build like four more incursors now. That's actually, it sounds absolutely fun, if nothing else. But man, it that is... is uh, yeah, I, I can confirm. It was pretty pretty amazing to try it. I, 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 didn't, I didn't win with it, but I also had some horrendous dice luck when I tried that. So I kind of make sense. If you at the end of the day you got to roll dice, right. and if they, you don't roll well, sometimes it doesn't matter. Um, yeah. So for the other ancillary options, you know, we've got the Sisters of Silence. Obviously, the so- Tempest of Signs are going to take over the Casper right. because they're exact exactly. same models. So, do you have you thought about the Sisters? What What else is on your roster as yeah. far as the ancillary options are? No, that's, that's a great. great. I think. Uh, there is so much stuff to try that it is, and even mentioning like each different drop having a different kind of play style, that I have actually gone to, I mean, really um, a tool that I've never had available to me on a team before and not really. So when I'm looking at my the Inquisition stuff to begin with, they have smoke grenades. And I know that this is, you know, if you're a Phobos player or probably a Commandos player, they're like, yeah, this is a standard part of our kit. Like, yeah, what's so neat about this? Well, coming from, like, not having that and being able to all of a sudden have breachers with, you know, you can move six models with shotguns up the board or, you know, their melee specialists and the Inquisition melee specialists in, up into a dominating position on the first turn and not have to worry about being punished by, you know, vantage shooters or things against most teams. Obviously, there's, you know, some that ignore obscuring and stuff, but there's a lot of teams that that doesn't work against. And being able to establish that kind of board presence is huge. So Definitely, definitely could see that um, with the Inquisition squads, much broader array of choices. Mm-hmm. They're, play, being able to play them means that you could adapt your original play style into something slightly different with a couple more options because yeah. inquisition are inherently a horde team. However, <laughs> with their ancillary options, you can be a horde with a stronger anvil, basically, you know, better saves, or you can have better guns or you can have better whatever. Right. And then you have these other operatives that kind of fill out the edges of your strategy and then a much broader equipment pile than most people are generally allowed to have because they have yeah. crack grenades, frag grenades, yeah. stun grenades, smoke grenades, Little extra swords, like like with lethal five. Yep. And then <laughs> they also have the servo skull that the hunter clade have. They've got the refractor field, so they can get a yep. four of invul. So there's a lot of nice options on the Inquisition. And if there's just, one thing I don't see a lot of people talk about, it's the actual Inquisition operatives. So oh man, <laughs> which ones? Which ones are you using? I know everyone has right. to have plasma bro because who's gonna leave home without their plasma blast? You know, is it the- you, Joe? It's honestly, I find myself in a lot of games wishing I'd taken the multi melta because there are, and it's again, it's a weird thing because I know you have people have to respect the plasma, like the two, in, but it becomes a game of just positioning people 2.1 inches outside of each other because, you know, it's everybody knows where that servitor is. The servitor is one APL, so you have to either use your comms on him to give him the extra APL or he's, but it's. It is a model that you have to have a plan. Like, I mean, you definitely have to have a plan for everything you're using. And the servitor is good, don't get me wrong. But there is, uh, there are times where just being able to have the guaranteed AP2 hit is nice. Like, and then, because killing yourself on the blast with an overheated plasma shot does not feel great. So, in as Has I, it so, happened to you? Not yet, but it has definitely come close. Tell us so about it. The, I can count on one hand how many actual multi-model hits I've gotten with the plasma cannon. And so even with something like, so with Corey, the way that the, it, I believe it's worded, you can't bounce it around to all the different models that are being blasted and things. So you're basically getting one reroll on your initial target there. And so if you just happen to roll trip ones or something like that in your next one, you're kind of cooking your servitor. 
it makes me feel bad for whoever has to clean that guy up at the end of the day because that is not a not going to be a good time. <laughs> so, so not I'm, not quite at the spot where you've hit three people and then had your gun servitor just implode right. from the <laughs> from the righteous fire of plasma. Yeah, it's tried. It's tried. I haven't. I've saved it from that so far. But it is one thing I will say too that I found Inquisition. They are super CP heavy. They're incredibly CP hungry, which will make the next comment I'm going to say sound a little bit hypocritical. But I think in terms of operatives, I, I operatives I don't even roster anymore. The auto savant. Is I think that you leave the, the writer. Yes, the guy that gives you the extra CP. I think you just leave him at home because the way there's a weird anti synergy between how his CP generation works and absolute authority. So when we say, like, you're going to no deploy, mm-hmm. um, that point doesn't go into effect. And if you look at the wording on his CP generation, it's the second time a ploy is used. So most are more often than not, if you've got a ploy that an opponent's going to spam, like just a scratch or, you know, um, brace for counterattack or something like that, it uh, you're normally not going to allow that ploy to go into effect in the first place. And Inquisition can lean super hard into support models already. You've already got the interrogator and the tome school, which aren't doing a lot for the team in over in terms of overall output. So you've really got to rel- rely on your other operatives to get work done. So yeah, I've always read the interrogator as basically the equipment hog on the team where you have to give fill him out with equipment so you can either have a slightly better gun or a slightly better melee profile so that he's not just a dork, basically just a eight wound, uh, you know, short yeah. range, uh, <laughs> you know, veteran guard. With Honestly, no abilities. The guy just no, mostly I use them for uh, a, a button pusher. That's normally their job because especially it's they're so easy if your opponent's taking headhunter that that is a dead operative for real quick. Um, I've really tried to start spreading my equipment out around the. I have started taking the hexorcist more after the FAQ. I clarification. I'll say there's the way that this works now, and I'm just waiting for the time somebody takes a hexorcist against somebody else playing Inquisition and uses the hexorcist to invalidate their roster. <laughs> because if you look at the way that the rules work now, the fact that you can invalid, like you can take away Frenzy on Felgor, for instance, it's not a model specific ability, it's team wide. And so just the fact that the Inquisition get the whole roster, it's their special rule. Like, and I might, I'm being slightly, you know, uh, slightly silly, choose, sure. but yes, it's like, it's just that they took a rule that was already complicated and just made it way more. <laughs> I think we see the intent on it now a little bit better, but it is trying. Yeah. Like, can you stop mutants from mutating? That is true. I, mean, uh, it's a, I think right. so. So for listeners who don't know, the Hexorcist is a debuff model and a buff model on the Inquisition squad. He's the dude with the crazy hair, I think. Yes. Triangle so the hair. dude with the with the with the back to the future dock hair. Yes. Um, it has Chasen. Chasen is basically a one AP ability for someone within six inches to lose a special rule on their data card. That's that's loosely what it's worded as. And loosely, the yeah. FAQ that just came out is specifically calling out if you chase in a frenzied Felgor, basically a guy who's just sitting in the middle of the room screaming out top of his lungs. If you yet tell him he's done, been a bad boy, he just falls to the ground and dies because you've removed the frenzy frenzy word from his data card and he collapses to the ground. So maybe there's some interesting things. I do think that for what it's worth, the torments and the Mutants are probably fine because they are wholly separate data cards, which is fine. But maybe for something like the Anointed on Legionary, you would undo a demon mode because I, those are that is a special word. Yeah, it it's just it gets to be. So I think we yeah definitely need some, some cleanup. But in the I will say though that the honestly I'm not finding myself needing to use chasing as much with it, like removing like feel no pains or something. Ramal is great. But just simply using it to deny rerolls, like if you're going into a team that uh, I played a game against Hunter Clay last night, for instance, and being able to turn off rerolls on the Rust Stalkers was great. Yeah. It, so from, yeah. Yeah. So for our listeners, Hexercise is the Hexercise's base ability that doesn't cost AP. It is whenever an enemy operative is with visible to and within six of the Hexercise, 
and makes a fight or shooting attack, they cannot reroll attack or defense dice. So he's just a six inch bubble of no funny business, yeah. which if you know about as a player who has the rerolls, kill it first, kill it with fire. Mm. <laughs> and if you haven't gotten got by a rule like this before, get ready because natural dice rolling can be really hard for all my Corsair and Phobos players who have had to sit and look at their four attacks on threes land with one or two hits. You know, we all know that pain. And me and Joe as former Pathfinder players, we absolutely do not know yeah. that pain. <laughs> for, uh, for what it's worth some of the older design teams you know we used to pick up tons of rerolls pathfinders had basically two rerolls per person so four attacks on fours felt not that bad yeah. whereas four attacks on threes with no rerolls feels pretty bad right jason that's totally true just gotta <laughs> overwhelm it with weight of fire <laughs> yeah 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 ah uh. Have you had any other um, fun stories on the Inquisition agents that you want to call out? Because I know that we've talked, we, we've spent a lot of time talking about the ancillary options, I think, kind sure. of across the board as a community. But I think for the individual operatives, you mentioned you don't like the auto savant nearly as much as the meta might may have you believe just because right. of the interaction between it and the Imperial Authority. It's not Imperial Authority. It's absolute authority. the absolute authority. Basically, yep. because you stop the tack ploy from ever having fired, you can never farm CP off of the subsequent attempts or even the subsequent like finishes. You just never get CP from it. So you're just I, spending four CP over the course of the game. Um, but there's other operatives. You know, we've got the Death World, the Pinot Legionary, the Pistolier. Oh, I'm sure the Pistolier's got some great stories. So tell oh. us, you know, which which of the operatives for a new budding Inquisition player would you say you have to build after you've played however many games you've played Just and gone to a tournament yeah. and you know had your worst performance <laughs> so far. hey i did okay at kansas city i took uh <laughs> sixth or seventh with them at kansas city yeah, yeah. So, i think yeah, you were that's... the you were the top placing inquisition player i was the only inquisition player. yeah, yeah. well so, i mean yeah you were seven out of like 30 <laughs> 30 something right Kansas? I have forty something. I yeah, yeah. Kansas, Kansas was a Kansas yeah. was a big tournament to do. So, to take seven that, so. yeah, I think so it's definitely a good result. I'm just I'm just yeah. teasing you a little bit. No, no, no. I know that. Uh, no, it's uh, the pistol deer for sure. It is the way that pistol barrage works. So I mean, anybody familiar with uh, corsairs and the starstorm duelist? I'm sure there are other uh, the well actually Star striders also have a, a double shooting model. Yes. So. Yeah. Yes, and then is... I think Wormblade had the other the other notable example. Yes, because yeah, the, the Crutes the Crutes Pistolier is a little bit more restrictive in that he can only take a dash and sh double shoot, whereas yeah. that is not the case for the Pistolier, the um, Starstorm Duelist, or the leader of Vane's retinue. Yeah, on Star Striders. Yeah, because yeah, I've had is... some good stories with him. So yeah, tell us, oh, yeah, tell us a little yeah. about the Pistolier. Go ahead. Well, the neat part about the Pistolier is that it's got. So I have yet to actually use the silent on its silent auto pistol. I'm not really sure if that was just they thought it looked cool to put a, but whatever. The it probably looks cool. Yeah, I mean it's a neat model. So they, but for sure the scoped plasma pistol is such an amazing profile that so. You can put an extra AP on the model, move dash, and essentially, if you've already got a model that is wounded within six inches, you can try and finish it off with the auto pistol. And then you can use the scoped plasma pistol to take a long range shot at another model somewhere, anywhere on the board that you can have a legal shot at. So it's not just within six inches that you need to have that restriction to. So there have been times where, you know, double kills on one activation are always great and the pistolier can not always do it but it is your most reliable model for probably if you're not trying to pull off reaps or anything to to get it to do so it's it's a nice but then sometimes if you just really need a model dead it'll it'll do it so it's it is a fantastic model to be able to yeah to have access to and it's your most accurate shooter outside any of the support options so it's the only thing with a three plus i think on the team well outside of okay the interrogator yeah well with his bolt pistol pocket technique i think the the mystic into a lot of matchups is my mvp for a just the support spell is great but you should also be strapping that guy with a master crafted auto pistol every game because on two ups with indirect, that guy is hitting almost all of his shots all the time. And it's a it's a 
kind of like a it's like a bolter shot that is indirect. So yeah. you can yeah, you you can definitely scalpel out a lot of uh problem pieces early on if you can use that right. Yeah, so you know, just to level it up, basically there is the master crafted auto pistol equipment on the Inquisition squad that takes a normal pistol and upgrades it into a bolter pistol effectively. I mean it's master crafted, so it's probably just firing like gilded bullets with plat- platinum tips or something. Who knows? But yeah. because the Mystic Agent is also using an auto pistol that happens to have indirect because she is a blind model. Right. I think that's the yep. the Lord. Yep, yes, that's a the, blind yeah. model. So yeah. it's four attacks on twos, two, three, indirect, range six. So turning it into a four attacks on twos, three, four, indirect because she's a wholly blind person is actually it sounds like a very powerful uh, operative. You know, she might still have a five up save and seven wounds, but she can put out some good support while also lining up a shot. And if you have double comms on a Kasserkin, you know, you get a get a surprise play or, you know, you could set up the quad three APL plays at the start of uh, turn two because you can backload the first two comms onto your best operatives and then reload at the beginning of turning point two with, you know, the mystic and someone else and then just send off your full bull your four bullets on quarries. And if you chain your quarries one after the other, you might be able to get some extremely fancy plays down the line. Yeah. And I also have to shout out the quest keeper. I think it might be my favorite model on the entire team. And I know that's Ooh. on a it is a on a team full of good models that I know I remember reading and you know some of the Discord discussions and just some of the other meta discussion that a lot of people did not particularly care for it. And I cannot disagree with that more strongly. It is I mean, yes, hitting on fours is not great, but with the right if you're using quarry correctly and you know you're prioritizing targets with its also innate rerolls on attacking which for it's one of its special rules and it's five up feel no pain that it is possibly the tankiest model on the team it's brutal so i mean anything you put it into close combat with like it's probably as long as you don't throw it into an assault intercessor it'll probably kill it you could even you know, throw a, a refractor field on it, it looks like. Yep. If you want it to be a big troll. Mm-hmm. Or you can yeah. give it a power knife for um, if you need to go into a goat. And, uh, you know, so you kill, you frenzy the goat, and then, you know, Guarantee your crit. Five up. Yep, exactly. So yeah. they're... It's definitely a cool, cool setup. It's also funny hearing you talk about lining up two sets of rerolls, because it's a very common mindset for a Pathfinder player. Yes. It's exactly. like there are two different ways I can get two separate balance rolls, but they have to be not explicitly balanced, otherwise they would overlap. So <laughs> Quest Keeper's rule is unrelenting, which is first time it fu- every time it fights and you are the attacker, so you must make a charge to get this going. You can re-roll one of your attack dice, and then Quarry also lets you re-roll one of your attack dice. So it sounds it's very funny hearing that the phrasing of it as a re-roll here and another re-roll here, so I have the reliability because it's yep. yeah. <laughs> definitely I, will say I, that. I hear I hear the Pathfinder in you yep. the Pathfinder and the learning some very good techniques from blooded because about just waves and because I will say one of these days I will try the Sisters of Silence out I did roster them for K for Kansas City Open mm-hmm. I'm specifically thinking about needing them or using them for the legionary matchup yeah, because when when like... would you bring or what is your I... Sister of Silence setup on your roster and when would you bring them in and why? Uh, probably against. The, uh, I think I don't know that I do it against Legionary now, like having some more time to reflect on it. Um, Warp Coven, definitely, because, Obviously. well, yeah. I, yeah, that's kind of a given. Um, I know there was some I talked to some players at uh, ATC this last weekend who were terrified that I was going to be bringing Sisters of Silence, so they were desperate to see my roster when I ended up submitting. But I think the idea of being able to turn... I mean, again, just the different looks the team can have is having a... a going from a shooting horde to a melee horde. I mean, it's just... It's unfortunate because you just... You do lose a lot of tools by not having access to comms. I mean, things like... And then the Sisters themselves aren't nearly as effective as they are in Talons just because they don't have access to, like, the face plates or face yeah. masks, whatever they're called and stuff. Yeah, but. their their big thing when you bring them in, I think, is that they upgrade your overall ballistic and weapon skill from massive fours to mostly threes, yes. which can make your ability to rely on your models on a play-by-play basis probably a lot higher. And right. then if you're also stripping away the um, the psychic abilities from a team, that can be crippling for 
some teams, Warp Coven mm-hmm. specifically. Uh, however, you know, Warp Coven maybe not in the best place uh, these days. Uh, there are, however, plenty of new psychers floating around in mm-hmm. the meta. You know, we have the Dark Commune psyker and the Felgor psyker. Both are very important on their teams. And if you had maybe a skew of Bolter Sisters, you would be able to ignore the Shadow ability because it is fully a psychic ability and not a generic rule. So you could just ignore that problem and just start blasting. But the biggest problem that I've always seen with the Sisters is that you have them for specific loadouts, but they are not flexible operatives. So yep. when you brought, when you rostered the sisters, what was the specific subset of sisters that you actually brought? Because power swords. Okay, all power swords. Yeah, it's. I mean, it was for a specific. Like, I mean, thinking like I said into the melee matchup mostly. Mm-hmm. So I mean, because I feel like that is one thing where Inquisition. It is the melee operatives are very good, but I think if it either shooting or melee, I think they will they will die faster in melee. Because, again, there's seven wounds and things. You do have things to keep them alive, but it is much harder to mm-hmm. than, say, like a space marine. So being able to just have those extra bodies to... And then you can use that to get around invuln saves and things like that. So, I mean, actually, maybe this would be a good counter drop into Talons themselves. I don't know. That seems... I know the irony there, but, you know, putting a bunch of power swords into a custody... Yeah, that might have some some use. Might be all right. Might be all right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it sounds like we're getting close to the end of the end of barrel today. You have a you have a keyword locked and loaded up in there, Joe. I do. Let's go with quest keeper. OK. All right. Quest you heard keeper, it here, folks. There it is. If you've listened all the way to the end, thank you. And once again, that password is quest keeper. Let's make sure we get let Joe do his uh, final call outs before we split for the week. Yeah, no. So again, um, anybody that is interested in um, coming out to Collinsville slash St. Louis for um, a big tournament to round out the summer, um, thanks to uh, think about Gateway Open. So on August 19th and 20th, um, you can find more information either floating around the various Discord channels or head to, I believe it's gatewaygamers.com. Don't you worry about it, fellow listeners. We'll have it in the show notes. Yeah. So there we go. Perfect. So, yeah. And then so hope to see uh, as many of you out there as we can get. So and for, for on, anyone a little bit closer to the East Coast who's looking for an open tournament, we've also got the Goonhammer Invitational uh, August 18 or 1920. It'll be all open and it'll be Goonhammer's first uh, kill team event. So if anyone is listening and is interested in coming, we do have our ticket secured. It sounds like Joe's working on their ticket for the Gateway Open. So hopefully we'll have two ticket events that weekend and we'll be able to get an article up on Goonhammer to talk about it.